Hi, I'm Robin from Rainbow Gardens, and today we have a very special guest with us, Laura Jarvis, owner of the Butterfly Landing. And we have heard your requests. Many, many people have asked us about uh, many questions about milkweeds. So we're going to try to clear up some of that confusion for you today. Hello everyone, my name is Laura Jarvis and I am owner of the Butterfly Landing and one of the things that I've been doing over the last 15 years is working on a lot of different types of milkweeds, especially our native milkweeds. So just so you know, while we talk about all of these different varieties, all of these in front here, all of these are all native milkweeds. So we've got a lot we're going to talk about today and we're going to kind of break them down into, you know, one at a time. And um, hopefully when we get done, you guys will uh, be assured you can go out and add more milkweeds to your pollinator gardens. So first of all, let's talk about uh, the category of the drier type of natives or the natives that like a little bit drier weather. Um, one of the one that we always, always hear everybody talking about is antelope horns. So this right here is an antelope horn and or horns, depending on how many seed pods it has, I guess. So these are very interesting. The antelope horns is one of the more difficult to grow. It doesn't like to be overwatered. The main reason it is so difficult to grow is that it will shoot down a very long tap root. A lot of times, even in these pots when I'm growing them for you guys, the root will come out the bottom and go down. That's how they survive. They germinate really fast in the rains in the springtime and they get that root down really, really fast and then they will grow quickly while there's moisture and then when we start having really, really dry weather like what we have had uh, during the latter part of this summer, um, then they'll go dormant. They'll go to seed and go dormant. So a lot of you, if you have these in your yards, you probably don't even know where they are. When they're in pots, they're very slender and there's not a whole lot to them. And that is a good, healthy, um, actually uh, larger than most antelope horn. Now let's talk about zizodes. Zizodes actually has become one of my more favorite varieties over about the last four years. Um, it seems to be uh, very willing to come back year after year after year. I've had one in a large container that I put a lot of uh, perlite and expanded shale and things to make it a good well draining soil mix and it's just a happy camper sometimes I get uh, seed pods off of it the zizodes you'll see it along uh, the roadways out in the parks and so forth it if there's any drawback it's that it doesn't like too much moisture so I don't put this in a garden area where I've got other things that like a lot of moisture I'm going to go ahead and plant it where um, I can control that a little bit and absolutely a good amount of drainage. Um, it is one that both the queens and the uh, monarchs love. So um, it's really one that I do recommend. I would recommend this. Try this in your garden. I bet you'll like it. Alrighty, we're going to talk about uh, one of the vines. There are several different milkweed vines. Um, this one I happen to have and I've been working on it to sell you all. Um, one of the reasons I do like this vine is because the soldier butterfly can host on this vine. Um, so it's one that I've wanted to add so maybe I can get some uh, additional soldier butterflies in my garden area. Another thing about these native milkweeds that we've been talking about, I'm kind of uh, categorizing these in the moisture levels um, that they like. And the first two zizodes and antelope horns, they do like to be on the dry side. And this one is, um, it can take the dryness. It's a true native, 
but it also likes moisture and it will tend to spread and grow in bloom with a, a little, you know, spring rains and so forth. And that's when it does the majority of its growing. Then it might get another spurt of growth if we have some fall rains. And then all of these are gonna go dormant uh, for the winter time and don't ever cover your native milkweeds for the winter time. You're always gonna just leave them out. They are used to the cold and some of them actually do a little better with a, a nice cold spell to them. So the fringed twine vine, and it does, it will twine on things. So if you don't want it in the middle of your garden twining on things, I would say keep it separate. It can grow in a pot like we talked about doing the zizotes, uh, some good drainage uh, in uh, materials in your soil so it drains very well. Um, and um, it's pretty easy to grow. It has very light colored blooms, maybe pink or whitish, kind of just depends. Um, and. Uh, the queens will host very readily on this, the vine as, as well as the soldiers. So uh, it might be something that's a little bit different than you've ever seen before. And maybe one that you want to add to your garden like I've done with mine. Alrighty, next let's talk about the purple milkweed vine. Now this will not vine like the last one we talked about, the, the uh, fringe twine vine. It's totally different. This tends to make more of a large mat and kind of spreads out. If it's close to other plant material, those little ends will just kind of go up and into the other plant material and just lifts itself up. It has a very dark purple star-like bloom when it blooms. So when we say purple, I'm not, it's not like royal purple, like somebody's robe or something like that, no. It's a very, very dark purple, but a lot of the milkweeds don't have a bloom that's that dark purple. So that's one reason they call it purple milkweed vine. They can differentiate it from some of our other varieties. This also tends to get this ginormous taproot. Um, some of them that I have grown in pots, this thing is humongous. And I've seen it go down literally feet into the ground. So once it gets a root down, it's pretty doggone hardy. Um, and so this one might be one that I would want to add in front of my garden plantings, um, dryness. I'd say it's getting closer to maybe the middle of dry and moist. Uh, I let them dry out a little bit in between each watering, but not near as dry as, as the other three um, that we've just talked about. So it's, uh, yeah, I'd say moisture is a little more towards the medium, but it is totally drought tolerant. And so if you are planting that in a native bed that's going to do just fine. Just get its little feet down and or that root so to speak and then it's going to be gorgeous. All right let's talk about common milkweed. This one um, we see it a little bit more uh, out in the native a little bit north of us but I've had pretty good luck with this plant in certain areas and also in pots. It can get quite large uh, so there's a lot of leaf material for the caterpillars to eat. Both the queens and the monarchs like this plant a lot. Um, and I've gotten several of them to come back uh, several years in a row. So I would say it's definitely worth a try. It spreads by big, large rhizomes underneath the ground. Um, so it can die back and come up in a different area. Uh, like our antelope horns often does. It kind of comes up in different areas than where you originally planted it. Um, so that's kind of interesting. It's always a, a hide and seek. Sometimes you never know where you're going to see it. Um, once it starts coming up, you usually get a very large cluster of good sized leaves to it. I would say medium water. I don't let these dry out near as much as my other varieties. I give this one regular fertilizer, whereas like the zizotes and, and antelope horns, I do not fertilize quite as much. Um, so it's a really good one. It is very, very, very cold tolerant. 
So if you're out in the hill country in, in an area where you tend to get a lot of winds and, and extreme cold in the wintertime, this one might be a really good one for you. So I hope you'll try it. Right, let's talk about the showy. This is one of my favorites. I remember this as a, as a little girl in, uh, when I lived in Colorado and it, I thought, had the prettiest of blooms of all of these. It has a very waxy, large cluster of pinkish star type color, uh, star type of flowers. And it's, it's very, very pretty when it blooms. It tends to be a lot upright once it gets going, very similar to our uh, common uh, milkweed. It's pretty much medium moisture. It can take some dryness. It is drought tolerant, but it seems to do better with a little bit more regular uh, watering. I fertilize these uh, on a fairly regular basis as well. Uh, again, one that can go uh, very, very, very cold. So <clears throat> again, if you're in an area where it tends to be colder than in town here and you need one, uh, this one might be one that you want to try. You're going to get quite a bit of foliage on it. Queens and monarchs do like the foliage. So as far as amount of foliage that you can get, <clears throat> it might be a good one for you to try. Okie dokie, let's do spider milkweed. Spider milkweed is uh, native all the way from here north up through uh, the central United States. So uh, we can see this one up in, you know, Panhandle, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. Um, and this is one of the ones that's a little bit tricky by seed. It definitely needs to be planted um, and out in the weather and gone through cold, gone through freeze, and then hopefully some spring rains for the seeds of this one to come up. It's a little bit tricky. So once you get it up, it, look at the beautiful leaves on this thing. This, this one is quite interesting. I've had one for about three years now, and it is, each season it comes back, it gets more leaves to it. So I've never had it bloom yet, but hopefully we're working on that one. Um, and you will find spider milkweed seeds available for sale. Uh, very, very few in the butterfly landing. We really won't have very many of them for sale this year, but we're working on them for the future. So, but I, I, I truly believe it's one that is definitely worth mentioning because it will uh, grow in our area. It doesn't seem to mind our extreme changes in weather and extreme hot and dry um, or extreme cold. So it's pretty adaptable as far as the different types of extremes. I think I would put it in uh, uh, a little bit more moisture category than the zizodes and the antelope horns. Um, I tend to water mine on kind of a secular basis because it has so many leaves. I think uh, it tends to use a little bit more moisture. So one definitely worth mentioning. I hope you try it. Alrighty, now I get to talk about Texana. Over the past probably four or five years, uh, the Texana milkweed has become my favorite. There are a number of reasons it has. Uh, number one, it seems to be fairly easy to grow compared to some of the other varieties that, that we have been talking about. Um, the other reason I really, really appreciate this plant is that it gets these beautiful white blooms and it will be very multi-stemmed like a small shrub and it will be covered in these white blooms. Well, when we get our milkweeds to bloom, we get a lot of other pollinators besides just our monarchs and our queens on our plants. So we get some very interesting things like the tarantula hawks, um, some of the other native bees that you don't see often, uh, and bumblebees. So it really, when you have a plant or two of this in full bloom, you'll see a lot of interesting activity on it, uh, not just the butterflies. So um, it's, it's been fun for me to watch and I like to take pictures. So I'll get a lot of really interesting pictures uh, with this beautiful plant. 
So along with the beautiful blooms, this plant also is a little bit more adaptable to moisture levels. Unlike the zizodes and the anilopores, it seems to just kind of take moisture in stride and it kind of takes dryness in stride. So um, it, it seems a little bit more adaptable to some of our garden areas. I've had them growing in the ground and in pots. So um, this one I would definitely recommend and the Butterfly Landing has been working really hard to try and get more of these available for you. We will have several uh, this fall uh, available for sale. If you are worried about getting you one and, and don't want us to be sold out, you, I might suggest you putting dibs on one and, and talking to Robin or myself about holding one for you. Uh, I have a feeling they may go fairly quickly. So hope you try it.